guess what? We have a holiday. It's called Jerusalem Day. We got back Jerusalem after thousands of years. We got control over it. There's a magnetism of Jerusalem it was, it, that's alive. It wasn't just felt in, wasn't just felt in uh, Israel. It helped revive Russian Jewish consciousness. It, you know, Jews were esta established in Western countries and they lived on the social margins of society. But Jerusalem provided a burst of national pride and a surge in Jewish confidence as Jewish enclaves across the Western world transformed into robust and vibrant Jewish communities, actively involved in all aspects of our culture and politics. The era, E-R-A, the era of Jerusalem sparked unprecedented religious and Torah growth as well as a renewed interest in Aliyah and tourism. The mysterious spell of this city continues to drive Jewish history. King David in Tehillim 122 referred to Jerusalem as the integrative city. Hubra la yachda, yachad, the city that unites the tribes. Because it wasn't part of any of the tribes, it was able to unite all the tribes. You get it? it would, and that's where they got it with Washington, D.C., you know, D.C.'s David City. It's not part of any of the states, and therefore it could serve to unite all the states. There's a healthy and unhealthy disagreement across the Jewish world about a range of issues, including important questions surrounding the state. A deep con consensus surrounding Jerusalem unifies vastly different communities and ideologies. The instinctive draw to our common city of magnets is an inalienable and eternal. That's Moshe Tarragon. <clears throat> In our discussion today so you could say you know happy Jerusalem day or Yerushalayim Sameach you can say that that's a good thing to say and we should uh, be happy for this day and we, whenever the God does miracles we sing songs we sing praises which is saying Psalms King David the ten righteous people that put the Psalms together they did it they did it all you know um, and it's appropriate to say when something went, we, we see God in bad things, we should see, we understand his presence there, right? So we have to understand his presence in good things, no? Rabbi Reuven Tradbux does a little uh, exposition on the Parsha. I think a lot of great things are hidden in his works that people don't appreciate. And I would like to cite some of his insights because they're all relevant to the tribes. Um, you know, this we ha in the first Aliyah in the book of, of Numbers, right? Uh, that's, we're starting it just now. In this Rosh Chodesh Iyar, the second year since living e leaving Egypt, Moses and Aaron are to take a census of all men over, 20, over the age of 20. And the leaders of each tribe are to assist these leaders to gather the people who, who establish to which tribe each person belongs. So we need the tribal leaders to work that out. So now uh, the book of Numbers is the march to the land of Israel. And it's truly the march to the promised land. I always say we gave up America. We gave up the land of stake and money for the land of milk and honey and the land of promise for the promised land. So we off our way to the promised land that God had pr um, promised to Abraham, to Yitzchak, and to Jacob, and to Moses at the burning bush. Moses was turned, told at the burning bush that God would take the people out of Egypt because of the promise he made to give them the land of Israel that has been the goal from the time of Abraham. Again, it shows most histories, one event follows another. For us, it's the opposite. The future determined our presence. The promise made for the distant future is what made us uh, act in the presence. So, so living in the land will come with a rich landscape. God says you are to settle the land.
but it has to be overlaid with an intimate connection to God. Because God says he will dwell in the temple. He will dwell in the tabernacle. You will approach me and you will settle this land, my land, and bring you close to me. And the book of Leviticus laid out this landscape, this overlay of holiness, of nearness to God. So what else happens? The census by the tribes, all the men over the age of 20, the age of army service is presented, and the tribes, all the different tribes make a big count, and it comes out to 603,550. However, the tribe of Levi is not included. They are to safeguard the, the tabernacle, camping around the tabernacle, transporting it, dismantling it, and assembling it. The tribe camp in distinct groups while the Levium encamp around the tabernacle. This is an accountant's parsha. Lots of numbers. While there are 12 sons of Jacob, Levi is not part of the count. That leaves 11 tribes, and there is no tribe of Joseph. His two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, take their place alongside their uncles as full tribes, hence 12 tribes, even without Levi. While, while the book of Numbers tra takes off in the desert and the wilderness, in English it's called Numbers, right? So, so, you know, in our oral Torah, it has an appellation. We call it Pikudim, which can be translated as Numbers. So we have both these names referring to this book of the Bible. In modern Hebrew, you'd say Pakid. So the, per, the person was de, ha, has that designated job to count. <clears throat> and the count and the numbers is preparation for the armed march into Israel. All have a role to play, but the accountants will notice that the tribes vary significantly in size. Did you guys notice that when you were checking out things? Because remember, they all started the same. Sons of, they were all sons of Jacob. So this is a hint at the prominent theme of differences. The tribes are different in name, in size. They have different colors. They have different uh, symbols. And later we will see in, in the encampment they were different. And while marching to the same destination, the Hebrew nation will always enjoy variation. Managing the variation is one of the themes of the Book of Numbers. Then the encampment around the tabernacle had two layers. The Levites were in close on the three and uh, on three of the four sides of the tabernacle, and the fourth side, the leading side, had Moses and Aaron. The entire twelve tribes were further removed from all sides. Did you catch what I mentioned? There's differentiation. It's, you know, you could have e pluralis unum, out of many there is one, and use that for, for global negative things. Or you could have e pluralis human, human um, out of many there is one, and use it for good, upright, righteous things, right? So the tribes, we like dif difference. Viva la difference. One of the things about... Um, Britam is that they they respect differences and they honor differences and Yair Davidi appreciates the differences and, and it's highly significant like I always say an orchestra a symphony needs all kinds of instruments each tribe encamped In a way that gives you a feeling of an army encampment, regimented, specific, detailed, organized, but an army for which purpose? To fight the anticipated foes in the land of Israel, or to be an army of Haggad, of Hashem, a fighting army, or a people with a God in their midst, or both. I think it's very significant that the next Aliyah, the next part of the Torah reading, we, we talk about Aaron and his sons, and Nadav and Abihu, who died without children and died because they offered strange fire, remember? I think that's very significant. Here we're talking about all the different tribes, and, and there's going to be differences into the final age and into the messianic age. The differences are good. It, 
you know, you just don't, you don't want to have uh, the same meal every day. You don't want to wear the same clothes every day. Viva la difference. And I'm telling you, Yair Davidi, he's an Orthodox Jew full of fear of God and love of Torah, and he's one of the most open-minded people in, the, in planet Earth, but not so open-minded like some of our friends are without the guidance of Torah. They're so open-minded, the brains fall out. Um, so I think it's very significant. We, we, we t when you mention these two of Aram's sons, Nadal and Avihu, who died because they were too original. They were too out of the ballpark. They were too much out of the box. They disregarded the instruction of their, of their sages, of their teachers, Moses and Aram. So with our structure, we have to have spontaneity. But the spontaneity has to still be in harmony and in beat with the general structure handed down from generation to generation. Without that, it's strange fire and they were ex they, they lost their holy lives because of it. You know, there are two groups mentioned here in this part of the Parsha. You have the Kohanim and the Levium, right? And it's interesting, take the Levium, they are to serve our own. And the Libyan are responsible for the tabernacle to support the priests and the people to facilitate the running of the tabernacle. The Levium shall take the place of the firstborn who became obliga obligated to Hashem when he saved them in Egypt. And there are two groups mentioned here, the Kohanim and Levium. The lineage of the Kohanim is given. It doesn't take up much room because Aaron is the Kohen and his sons. But he only has two sons after the two of them die because of being too spontaneous, being too original, and stepping out of the boundaries and crushing the, their historic covenantal heritage community's leadership and disregarding that leadership. So, so you've got to keep a handle on things. You can't, can't be too much into Woodstock. You can't be tiptoeing through the tulips. You have to still be based in the historic law passed on by the righteous lawgivers, right? Because, uh, so if you have, a, it wasn't a long list because you only have Aaron as the priest and his, his sons. And so he only had two. So the entire lineage of the Kohanim, of the priestly sect, was three people. The Levium, on the other hand, are the entire tribe, the descendants of Levi, son of Jacob. Their lineage at quite some length is given in the following Aliyah. I wanted to mention something about our Levium that we just talked about, that uh, something that we all should learn from, that all and all that were numbered of the Levites were 22,000. The great commentator of Nachmanides, the Ramban, asked a simple question. Why is it that the population of the tribe of Levi was the smallest of all the tribes? So he answers that all the tribes suffered under depression in Egypt, remember? And those tribes who endured such great pain and suffering, God responded by enabling them to become fruitful and multiply at an unnatural accelerated rate. This is from Hanach Yeris, Rabbi Hanach Yeris. However, the tribe of Levi did not experience the tortures. You know, they, they were anti-government. They didn't volunteer with the Egyptians and turn over their ID numbers or even go and get their ID numbers. They lived off the grid. So when he imposed, when the Egyptians imposed slavery, they were not numbered. They were, in the, they were not included in their bureaucracy. So they got out of being in slavery. Did you guys know that? So, but also, on the other hand, they didn't, they weren't crushed and oppressed. So therefore, Levi's birth rate continued only at the natural pace. At the time of, of the people's counting in, in this week's Parsha, their, their numbers were a bare minimum compared to the other tribes. So what, what you know, I, I just mentioned that Jerusalem Day is coming. We can appreciate this message. And the tribes are coming back. We should appreciate this message. Only through great toil and harsh sacrifices we, we made did our merit 
did we merit the great, the grand miracle of, of reuniting in Jerusalem? And it was almost, it was like supernatural. And only on the, the, the merit of our great toil and harsh sacrifices will we merit will the ingathering of exiles and the return of the 12 tribes in a supernatural manner. Because with that oppression, it, it, it's all pressure, all suffering, all pain equals atonement. And the, the tribes, the rest of the tribes except the Levi were suffering. And therefore, they got supernatural blessings to be fruitful and multiply. I wanted to say that one who is not born into the tribe of Levi could not attain any of those privileges, no matter how hard he tried. Nor could he he assume the the responsibilities of of the Levite, even if he sought to do so with commitment and fervor. This is Rabbi Dr. Svi Hirsch Weintraub. Um, it wouldn't help. He could be a great Hebrew, but he couldn't take the Levite's positions, which was God appointed. The Torah outlines the special duties of the Levites at length and in great detail in this week's Parsha, Numbers chapter 3 and 4. Later on in the book of Numbers, particularly in chapter 18, we read of the benefits due to them. The 12 other tribes of Israel are uh, simply, what would you say, um, they're not neglected. Quite, quite the contrary, they're, they're listed and their stations in the wilderness encampment and march are delineated very specifically. But the roles of the tens of thousands of members of these tribes are not specified at all. It's almost as if the Torah was telling us that unlike the Levites, they had no ascribed roles but were to pursue and achieve roles according to their individual motivations. That really fits the ten tribers who are so into Thomas Jefferson's rugged individualism. Thus, the community of Israelites in the wilderness was one in which one tribe had pre predetermined tasks which it did not choose and could not shrink, shirk, whereas the great majority of people had great freedom of choice to which roles in life to choose. The situation continued for many centuries and at last and last into the destruction of the Second Temple, even today, specialized roles roles for the descendants of Levi's persist, I'll bet, in a reduced and limited way. That's the greatness of our rabbis made all kinds of laws to protect their identity and keep it going. You know, in his masterwork, the Mishnah Torah, Hilchus Shemitah V'yobel, chapter 13, the Maimonides, he's not just my Maimonides, he's your Maimonides too, the Rambam describes the lot of the Levite in the in the rich and graphic detail. He stresses that although the Levites had no equal portion in the land, they did have their own cities and villages, right? Remember that? And the, the cities of refuge was theirs. And, and we explain, we, the oral Torah here, I'm just quoting a main, a main stay of the oral Torah, he explains to us that the Levite is ascribed a limited social and economic role in order that he be free to assume a greater spiritual role. It's like women are free some certain kinds of commandments, so they have, they're free to assume a greater spiritual roles. It's incumbent upon him to serve God in the temple service and to teach God's lords to the greater communities. Uh, so we have this original and dramatic statement which challenges the entire distinction ascribed in verses in this week's reading. But it doesn't really challenge, it just wakes you up and it's provocative. Because the Rambam says it's not only the tribe of Levi, but rather every individual in the entire world who if the spirit moves him to have achieved understanding and who wishes to separate himself from others and to stand before God and worship him, to shed from, from materialism, that God becomes his lot and inheritance forever and ever. It's as if we're opening up the closed society of the Levites. He offers a vision and notes that it is a vision for all humanity of the possibility to transcend the limits defined in this week's Torah portion. He suggests that each of us can potentially become a symbolic Levite, even if we are born to parents of other tribes. So what is strictly speaking as a scribed role 
becomes for Maimonides a role which can be achieved by anyone. This is a drastic, almost revolutionary statement, but is one which challenges every one of us and offers each of us an opportunity. It's not only the biblical Levite who can attain closeness to God and spiritual sublimity, great heights we all can but again remember he's a symbolic he can't go into the temple and do the service of the levites he he can rico cortez is is like doing the job of a levite teaching 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 preparing preparing people for and advancing them right and he's not officially hebrew so this is a challenge to all all of the tribes and to all of Judah, that we could live like a Le Levite, symbolically. But to do so, we need the motivation to assume greater responsibility, to suffer solitude, to be absolutely just and righteous, to teach others who might not wish to be taught. Then we all can achieve the benefits which were due of the ancient tribe of Levi. Not literally, though. We can then each say, as Momonides concludes quoting King David in Psalms, God, you are my portion and cup. You uphold my destiny. Now, um, I would like to hit the Haftorah, the Haftorah every week of the 54 uh, Torah readings every week throughout the year. We also have an accompanying prophetic Torah reading that has all kinds of, of interesting connections to that Torah reading, right? And we have from Hosea 2, verse 1 to 22, the background and the deeper meaning regarding this week's of Torah can be found in the Talmud in Sachim 87a, when God conveys to Hosea the seriousness of the sins of Israel. And you remember that stuff, guys? It's really heavy. It makes me cry to think about it. Hashem tells Hosea to, to name his youngest son Lo-Ami, not my nation, an expression of God's abandonment of his people. And yet then, immediately follows these most troublesome prophecies, Hosea starts our Haftarah reading with the words, the number of Israel will be as the sand of the sea that cannot be measured nor counted. And instead of being said of them, you are not my nation, it will be said of them, they are the children of the living God. This is from Rabbi Nachman Neil Winkler. It would appear that this new chapter does not begin a new prophecy, but is a continuation of the first chapter. Hosea seems to be telling the people that the terrible prophecy of God's abandonment of Israel, of which he spoke, is but a temporary one. Rabbi Simpson Rafael Hirsch says a beautiful little thing here. He says that the Haftorah's opening, the obvious connection between the Haftorah, the prophetic reading, and the, um, the, the five books of Moses reading is connected to the number of Israelis counted in the, in the Torah reading. However, the number of Israel will become as important as the sand. And by so doing, see, they counted, we counted in the Torah reading, and, and we're beyond counting in the prophetic reading. There's a connection about counting there. And by doing so, he clearly explains how the prophetic reading is meant to soften the harsh prophecy found in the first chapter and to give hope for the future of the people. And the final verses of the Haftorah are indeed comforting, as they promise God's return to his people, and that upon his return to his wife, nation, they will refer to him husband. The description of Israel's relationship with God being one of wife to her husband is purposely continued through the verses of punishment, as well to underscore that as upset the husband might be with his wife, he could never abandon her. That message is driven home in the very last verses of the Haftorah, words that men recite upon winding the tefillin straps around their fingers, a betrothal ring, so to speak, in a sense of, I will betroth you forever. Um, my teacher, Rabbi Soloveitchik, 
he said a really cool thing here. He said, marriage is not merely a civil institution pertaining to property and pleasure by two individuals starved for love and a convenient life. It is rather a covenantal community which is nurtured by the awareness of absolute belonging to each other. Married life is an, ex ex an existence in fellowship, togetherness. In it, a person finds completeness and existential fulfillment. So the Rub's approach to the message of Amos reminds us that even during this difficult time, Hashem remains committed to his faithful wife and will stand by her side. As Rabbi Soloveitchik declares, marriage distinguished itself by a deep sense of loyalty and faith. And when the prophet Hosea portrays the internal bond between God and Israel and these glowing ecstatic words, he exclaims, claims that Israel is similarly betrothed to God in faith. And no more really needs to be said on that. It really fits in good with a, with a happy Jerusalem day, right? Yair is the Shatchan, you know, the matchmaker. He's matching up Judah with, with uh, Ephraim. He's matching up Joseph, the ten tribes, with the Jewish people. He's bringing them together. He's He's imitating God, making matches. He's making us be tolerant of each other and our idiosyncrasies and our differences. And he's, he's emphasizing what unites us, not what divides us. And he's em emphasizing the big picture. And, you know, the, the, the devil is in the details sometimes, right? So he's not getting all bent out, as my friend Dr. Mordechai Meir would always say. He's not being bent out by the differences and the inconsistencies. He's looking at the grand picture. The landscape is vast. And he is making this reality between bringing Ephraim and Judah back in, in a wedding and bringing the whole 12 tribes back with a wedding with our God.